Blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as life, nor wanting, nor wasting, in might, thy justice like mountains, I soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. Changes thee, not changes changes, changes thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, all help us to see, tis only the splendor of light.
Yes. We had it stretched out on the piano and it doesn't fit there very well. <laughs> Uh, it's on the flash drive as. Do you don't have any kind of a computer? No, it's just my phone, and they don't make anything in the old the flash drives for the phone you look at. Oh, that's why. No, that's. He's talking about this poster. Yeah, a lot of. I don't have a website yet. Huh? On the flash drive, yes. On the website, no. Well, that's what he was saying. I'll get to you a little later. Maybe we can hold that up. It's actually the second slide of this presentation today. Oh, okay. Uh, you, it cost us three dollars to get the flash drive, and you can just throw a donation of whatever you can afford. And if you can't afford anything, take a flash drive. I want people to have the information. The Lord takes care of the rest. Ah, there you go. I am, I am promising to continue to pursue the website. It just, I. I've had to choose where my time needs to go. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, and it's been to the presentations versus that. But we're getting far enough along now, I, I guess I have to figure it out. <laughs> All right, let's, let's bow our heads for prayer, and we'll begin. Oh, gracious Father, thank you for your precious Sabbath day, a day of rest to come and be with you. I want to thank you for safe travel mercies as we had some interesting roads getting here. <clears throat> but you're so good and you're so kind, and we thank you for that. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to be present this evening in our hearts and our minds. Please speak through me. You and I have talked a lot about how important it is that it's you that speaks, not me. Father, be with us. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> All right. Tonight you're going to want a Bible in your hand, and I understand you have some in the pews. If you didn't bring your own Bible, the, the reason for that is what I'm going to present tonight covers a lot of space from the scriptures, and I'm not going to cover every verse, and you'll see why soon. But we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, parts of Daniel chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at Revelation 13. So you can all go, phew. <clears throat> so... Um, Thank you, Lord. <laughs> no matter what we believe, technology is not our friend. It is only because the Holy Spirit intervenes on our behalf. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Here we go. If I turn the clicker on. This is just to give you a heads up. There's a lot more thorough coverage of these topics, and that includes the Great Controversy chapters 25 to 33. Um, I'm going to be pulling things from a lot of places today. And as we begin, there are three news clips that have happened in the last 24 hours that support tremendously things I had already put on here. I will talk about them. But we aren't going to take the time to cut them in tonight. One of those is 11 minutes long, and this is long enough. 
And so if you want the, that information, make sure I have your email address if you're not already on my email group, and I will send those to you so that you can watch them at home, okay? Because <clears throat> there's so much happening in the news right now. Yeah, there's very important stuff that's just happened, and we'll talk briefly about it, but you can get the clips. I'll share them with you. The story of the image and the beasts has a pattern that is repeated, and in case you didn't know this, we're just going to cover this very briefly. The image of the beast is described, and then Daniel or John <clears throat> are told how the fourth beast is destroyed. They were always worried about the fourth beast. Do you know why they're always worried about the fourth beast? Okay, that's part of it. But they're the one that ruled the longest and did, did the most destruction and persecuting. And so that was the one they were especially worried about. Daniel and John are reminded that if faithful, in the end, the saints win. Daniel and John are also reminded that God's kingdom wins in the final battle. So when you're giving someone terrible news, usually you'll hear, do you want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> and so God was doing the same thing with Daniel and John. He was giving them the bad news first, but he was reminding them with the good news. And the pattern happens over and over and over throughout the chapters we're going to be looking at. Each time the pattern expands, it gives more information, and it fills in the picture. Even the prophets, this is phenomenal, who were favored with the special illumination of the Spirit, did not fully comprehend the import of the revelations committed to them. Let that sink in. The meaning was to be for unfolded from age to age as the people of God should need the instruction therein contained. And then 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12 is quoted, Yet, while it was not given to the prophets to understand fully the things revealed to them, they earnestly sought to obtain all the light that God had been pleased to make manifest. They inquired and searched diligently, searching what? or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. <clears throat> what a lesson to the people of God in the Christian age, for whose benefit these prophecies were given to his servants, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us did they minister. Witness those holy men of God as they inquired and searched diligently concerning the revelations given them, for generations that were yet unborn. Contrast their holy zeal with the listless unconcern with which the favored ones of later ages treat this gift of heaven. What a rebuke to the ease-loving, world-loving indifference which is content to declare that the prophecies cannot be understood. Not infrequently, the minds of the people and even of God's servants are so blinded by human opinions, the traditions and false teaching of men, that they are only partially to grasp the great things which he has revealed in his word. We're going to do a brief review. How many of you have ever seen these images before? Okay. So Daniel 2, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a vision. And he gives it to Nebuchadnezzar, in a way, he can understand. Did they worship idols? Did they have the king in idols all over? Yes, they did. So God gives it to the king in a way that he can understand. Very quickly, the head is made of what? And it represents arms and chest. Okay. Then the belly and thighs. And they represent what country? Greece. And the legs are? And represented? And then we have the feet? Iron and clay. And what did they represent? The divided kingdoms of Europe. Okay? Now, for me, the stone cut out without hands is the Ten Commandments. That's what was given to Moses the first time. 
and probably there are Israel, Israelite people, Jewish people, who believe that first set was made of sapphire because that is the pavement under God's throne in heaven. Blue represents the law. And so we will always see in my illustrations that the Ten Commandments are that stone cut out without hands. Because in the end, it comes down to man's law or God's law, and it's God's law that's going to take out the, the image. And so that's why you will see it illustrated that way in my, my presentations. Okay, so many years later. So Daniel was probably in his 20s when this image happened. But he is in his 80s when God gives him the vision of the beasts. And it's then set up to help understand the future kingdoms that are going to come to play. So can you imagine, Daniel's known as the one who does, interprets the dreams, and yet God doesn't give him his own dream until he's in his 80s. So that's encouragement for some of you who are older and you want to say you're too old and God can't use you anymore. Mm, I don't think so. I think God can use anyone who is willing. So we're going to do a quick breakdown of the beasts. So... These are the beasts, if you look in, we're now moving from Daniel chapter 2. Oh, before we go, though, let's back up just a smidge here. Well, we'll get to it in a minute. Okay, let's go ahead and go to Daniel 7. So you have that in front of you. You can make sure I'm not making up any stories. Okay, so in Daniel um, 7, where do those beasts come from at first? It tells you in verse 3. The sea, okay. So Daniel 7, it tells us these beasts come from the sea. We have the lion with wings. What kind of wings? Eagle. Eagle's wings. And the lion represented what country? Babylon. Babylon, okay. Then we're told the wings are plucked off, and the lion is made to stand up on the earth, and he's given the heart of a man. This looks at when the king was made a beast for seven years and he's finally converted and his heart of stone becomes a converted heart. And the interesting thing is we are always told that the United States um, is the nation formed because it comes out of the earth, which means unpopulated. So I'm just going to share with you that I've seen a second perspective to that and it starts here. This beast is made to stand on the earth. I think that that may represent a further action in an already established kingdom. And, and we're going we're gonna to take a look at that in the end. Right or wrong. So we know that that's Babylon. Then we end up with a bear who is who? Persia. Which is the stronger kingdom? Persia. Persia. And then there's Media, which is the lower kingdom. What are you grinning about, Rick? <laughs> Ah, yes. <laughs> then there's three countries that are in its mouth. Of course, Media Persia took over Babylon, right? And then it gained other territory, which is what each kingdom did. Now, we're going to take a look at the leopard, but I have some questions about the leopard I still don't have answers to. Why chicken wings? If you look in the scriptures, they're fowl wings. Have you ever watched a chicken or a turkey fly? It's a short burst, it's, it's not, and you will hear people tell you that those wings made it swift. I disagree. I complete. the leopard is swift. No, and so my question is, is there a wing for each head? When Alexander dies, the generals kind of split up into a little short reign and it's not much and then the country dissipates and gives in way to Rome. I don't have an answer. Yes? It might refer to, remember when they had the intermarriages between the kings to try to make things work and I can see where the chicken wings would come in there but there's a short flight so let's try something that's decent work Yeah. and they never did so they always tried something else to try to marry somebody else. That's just a thought. Yeah. It could be. This is just one I, I'm guessing at. I don't have an answer for. 
I have never found an evangelist that addresses this. But the Bible is very specific. The eagle's wings on the lion give it power, give it loft, give it majesty. But these are chicken wings. And, and I, why, why that's specified? God could have just said four wings. Yes? Yeah, it, it, it could have just, yeah. The leopard is swift. How about weakness? It could also be a sign of weakness. That's true, because they did have issues. He died of an alcohol poisoning, yeah. If you take a beast and fawns in the wild, they, they fly for miles and miles. So it might not be like they can protect They might like be like the birds actually fly for hundreds of miles. Yeah. Okay, yes. Oh, you got that. I didn't think about that. So, yeah. so maybe the whole symbol together is it that implication of a rush to rush conquer and then... They're done. Yes. Yeah. So this gives us all something to ponder. If you ever come up with a certain answer, do let me know. I'm still searching that one out. So this creature has four heads. It looks like a leopard. It has fowl wings. Now, whether those are geese or turkey wings, I couldn't tell you. Um, but there's four heads, four generals. And as I drew this, you can see that I gave each head a wing. So <laughs> I was kind of leaning that direction. This is interesting. When Greece conquers, not only do they conquer the previous country's territories, but they became masters of the Oriental world. They took over Asia, um, parts of Egypt. Um, yes, sir. That is what we've been taught, but even if you watch a goose take off, it's not fast. No, it's not. There's, there's nothing fast about fowl wings, and that's part of what we were talking about. So you can see they, they took over the Persian Empire. They would have taken over Media, um, Media and Persia's area. They would have taken over Babylon's area, and then they expanded their realm into Asia. Now, this is the fourth beast. If you looked on my chart, he's drawn like a red dragon. After much more studying and looking at how our earlier Protestant people drew the, this beast, um, they avoided drawing it like the dragon because it confuses people. The dragon is not the beast. Right. And so he looks a little bit like a dragon. I couldn't find any creature big enough to crush and stomp things with his feet. So, but I made him look like iron. <laughs> uh, actually, that's a Rottweiler and a lynx face combined to produce that face. So, anyway, this is how I chose to draw this terrible beast. We don't have a lot of description other than the claws, um, the color, um, some of those kinds of things. All right. We know that there's a papal supremacy involved, but before the papal supremacy, what was there in the fourth beast? We had Rome, pagan Rome, thank you. So pagan Rome ruled first, and then there's a papal supremacy. The papal Rome actually comes in in 476 AD when Rome is divided into the 10 toes or the 10 horns, same thing. There's a political Europe. This is its, had its first supremacy, and we're going to use that term, so kind of think in that line. The, the beast turns into a papal supremacy, number one, and we're going to talk about that as well. All right. When it comes in, there's a little horn that comes up. It takes out three tribes, basically. Um, literally, these would not give up the Sabbath. They it was involved in that process. They would not follow the, the papacy's 
instruction, and so they had them completely annihilated from the planet. So um, in 476, the Ten Horns rise to divide Western Europe. The first three we know are taken out. The remainders are England, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Germany, France, and Switzerland. Okay, Those are their modern-day um, countries that were represented. Now we're going to talk about that stone kingdom. The feet of iron and clay, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy tell us they can't cleave to each other, right? That's why there's separate toes. Or in the beasts, they're separate horns, right? Okay, but this is interesting, and I want you to look at verse 35 of Daniel 2. We're going to back up just a second. So go back in your Bibles to Daniel 2, verse 35. This is really important for us to see. I'm going to back up and start with verse 34. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. If it stopped there, I wouldn't make the understanding that I'm about to share with you. But let's read verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away. Can we assume from verse 35 that when the stone destroys the image, every country is represented? Yes. They're all labeled here specifically. So we're going to look at that um, in our presentation in a little bit. Let's go back to Daniel 7, okay? So the stone kingdom is then described even further in Daniel 7, and it talks about the throne of God. It talks, of, you know, we know that from the great controversy that the law is inside the Ark of the Covenant. The picture is all there. Revelation 10 gives us a picture of Jesus as the intercessor, Great controversy goes into detail about the destruction of the beast. And in this particular setting, the coming of Christ is talked about, and it's in verse 14, 13 of Daniel 7. Um, that is actually, according to the great controversy, Christ, not his second coming, but his, in 1844, transferring from the holy place to the most holy place and the judgment beginning. Because that's all got to happen for him to have his kingdom. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Christ sees men so absorbed in worldly cares and busyness, perplex business perplexities, that they have no time to become acquainted with him. To them, heaven is a strange place, for they have lost it out of their reckoning. Not familiar with heavenly things, they tire of hearing about them. They dislike to have their minds disturbed concerning their need of salvation, preferring to engage in amusements. But the Lord wants to disturb their minds, that they may be led to take hold of eternal realities. He is in earnest with them. Very, very soon they will all know him, whether they desire to or not. The angel of mercy is now folding his wings and stepping down from the throne. Wow. The Lord is coming. If he were revealed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, would you be ready to meet him? Have you made your peace with him? Would you like to be sent away from God's presence to share in the humiliation and punishment of Satan and his angels? But if during your lifetime you rob God of the service which he has purchased with his own blood, spending all your time in foolish words and amusements, you will finally lose heaven. How can you afford to barter away for worldly pleasure the gift of eternal life? God's arms are open to take you to himself, and he invites you to come to him. Choose life, eternal life. Accurately recorded in the books of heaven are the sneers and trivial remarks made by sinners who pay no heed to the call of mercy when Christ is represented to them by a servant of God. As the artist takes on the polished glass of a true picture of the human face, 
So God daily places upon the books of heaven an exact representation of the character of every individual. Think about how serious that is. God has the true exact representation of your character, of my character. Those who are saved must travel the same road over which Christ journeyed. He says, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The character is to be formed according to the Christ likeness. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. And this is an important quote that really floored me the first time I found this. Many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. Every element of power is about to be set to work. Past history will be repeated. repeated. Old controversies will arouse to new life, and peril will beset God's people on every side. Intensity is taking hold of the human family. Are we seeing that happen? It is permitting everything upon the earth. Study Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history will be repeated. We, with all our religious advantages, ought to know more today than we do know. And this one, (laughs) the light which Daniel received direct from God was given especially for these last days. The visions he saw, this is a specific vision, the visions he saw by the banks of the Uli and the Hittikal are now in process of fulfillment and all the events foretold will soon have come to pass. What is the vision by the Uli and the Hittikal? Daniel 8. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Daniel 8, we're going to take a look at this vision that Daniel is given. So there's a goat that attacks a ram. That ram is literally, the horns are broken off, it's trampled to death, and then the goat grows great. And when it does, the horn is broken off, and in its stead, four horns are to come up afterward. We have been always taught that this was Greece, The horn is Alexander the Great, okay, and he took out Media Persia. I'm not saying there isn't a past representation for this prophecy. Uh, Do we have any prophecies that repeat? What about Matthew 24? It was about Jerusalem's destruction, but does it apply to the last days? Yes, it does. And so we're going to take a look at this vision specifically because we just saw that this vision, the one by the Uli and the Hittikal, is now in process of fulfillment and all the events foretold will soon have come to pass. So we're going to break it down to the first part with the goat and the ram. And we're going to take it down to just the goat. All right. The goat is supposed to be the king of Grisha, if you look at your Bible. And the king, the first, or the horn is the first king. We know that it's supposed to come from the west, not touch the ground, and that this is a military vision. Isn't it a battle that's going to take place? We know that beasts represent what? Kingdoms. Okay. And so this is a kingdom fighting another kingdom, right? Okay. If you're in the military and you're looking at a battle and there's no contact with the ground, we would call that an aerial assault, okay? And so as we take a look at this, um, there's some very interesting information that happens. Daniel, by the way, has this vision during the third year of Belshazzar. What was happening during the third year of Belshazzar? But what was happening while he was partying? Media and Persia were diverting the river (laughs) that flowed underneath the city, and they ended up walking in on that water, that riverbed, and took over the city. So as we take a look at some of these things, the timing is impeccable. 
All right, so there is an island called Cyprus, which is divided, the Turks on the northern part of Cyprus, and the bottom part of Cyprus is owned, or not owned, but controlled. is it's controlled. There's Greek residents who live there, okay? And then there's a buffer zone right here that belongs to the United Nations. These two people have tried killing each other off an untold times, wow. and the United Nations has gotten involved and put in a buffer zone. The question is, are there countries that are killing each other all the time? Yes. Do we always get involved? We only get involved if we have something to benefit. Okay? Usually it's money or something we need. Or right. Okay? But we know from um, the Hutus and the Tutsis and what went, in in Rwanda, went on in Rwanda, did we get involved and help protect anybody during that situation? No, we did not. For three years, they killed each other, just slaughtered each other. And we didn't get involved at all. We didn't have, there was no benefit, right? This is a huge benefit. So on the southern part of this island, there are two large military bases. One belongs to the United States, and one belongs to the United Nations. Okay? And so, there are some who have presented that, do you remember Saddam Hussein? He was the king of Iraq. Iraq. Okay? Did we take him out? Yes. Was the United States involved? Was the United Nations involved? Yes. And so in doing that process, that was an aerial assault. It was most of the battle took place that way. Yes, we had some troops on the ground, but we did a major aerial assault, and guess where we did it from? Cyprus. Cyprus. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, I'm going to back up just a second. If you look at this, that goat comes from? Greece and the West. Is this west of where they were attacked? I don't know. <laughs> it is if you look at a world map. Sorry I didn't put one of those in here. Um, and so there are many people who began to think that this was a modern fulfillment of this prophecy. But I want to show you something even more modern that has taken place. Just within the last month or so, the United States has brought in those great big planes full of equipment and unloaded them in what country, do you guess? Greece itself. Wow. The United Nations has also done the same. And we are doing that to position ourselves to attack another country. And so you, this, ah, it took off. This shows us the U.S. and Greece are making plans to update their and this was phenomenal. When I saw this happen, I jumped up and down because I was like, oh, Father, this really matches and lines up with the things that are going on. Turkey, which is the northern part of, of Cyprus, is now reinforcing their Syrian troops for attacks on U.S. allies. And so the Middle East is on fire right now, in case you have not seen the news. And I was watching all of this, and I was like, Lord, this is okay, but I would really like some affirmation. The things that I want to send to you in your email, there is a woman who, who is a newscaster who breaks down the relationship um, with Iran and Iraq and the Middle East, and it's just phenomenal. We know from the scriptures that this beast pushes westward, and it pushes northward, and it pushes southward. And, and we also know that this, um, this is a permanent destruction that is going to take place. Okay, so the goat is identified, the body, and the horn. The ram in scriptures is only identified the horns. There's no definition given of the body. And I'm going to show you why that probably is. So if you look into history, 
especially if you look before 1920. In the late 1920s, the Jesuits began rewriting history. And I am not kidding you. You can go look in any set of encyclopedias and it is as clear as night and day. They began to rewrite things to make it so that Rome does not look like the beast. And um, one of the things they did was to change some of the information about Iran and Iraq as well. But if you go back, you will find, this is actually modern um, notes that I found. Oh, my pointer. Um, they were fixing a thousand year old mistake in 1978. There was an Iranian revolution. What this does is it breaks down that Persia became Iran, and it wasn't until 1978 that it was called Iran. Prior to that, it was always referred to as Persia. Um, <clears throat> this also shows you the modern history of Iran. It explains how they came in after World War I and used a big pair of scissors and just cut up the map and divided you into your country and you into your country and you into your country. And if you study history, you know that that's the case. They, they always do that. And when they do that, they don't necessarily care whether you're tribal or close. The line just gets drawn. And so um, you'll find that both Iran and Iraq tend to have Persian history. And I couldn't figure that out. I was, Lord, where's the media? Well, Iraq was considered part of the Median Empire but after Saddam Hussein was killed, what happened to Iraq? Iran grew up right away, became super powerful, and basically took over Iraq. So now in the news, you hear very little about Iraq, and it's mostly all about Iran. And interestingly enough, in the vision of the goat, that's exactly what happens. There's a smaller horn. The the Persian horn comes up later, and it's bigger, and it's stronger, and, and it, it matches it exactly. So then it says at the bottom here that Iran would be a battleground between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War, which it, it definitely was. All right, so we're going to take a look at what I found in my studies. If you disagree with me, that is totally okay. You're not going to upset me at all, but I want to take a look at it. So. What is the most powerful country in our world right now? It's not us anymore. It's the United Nations. It's a collective of nations. There is no longer one world power that dominates. There's a reason for that, and we're going to see it happen here. It is the United Nations that actually was involved with Iraq. We were the military that did most of that part of it, but they were involved in a lot of other elements of it. So I'm going to submit to you that the modern day equivalent of this would be the United Nations. They are powerful. They are like us setting up troops in Greece right now as we speak. And um, most of the equipment they're unloading is preparing for an aerial assault. If you've been listening to the news, how many of our battleships and our aircraft carriers have left our ports in the last 48 hours? 172 have left our ports because we are about to go to war with Russia very clearly. But the Middle East is exploding right now as well. So. <laughs> well, I like to watch it because I love to see this stuff be fulfilled. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. if this is Iraq and this is Iran, what is it that makes those countries important? It's ISIS. It's the Taliban. Those are the things that give it its power. Did we just totally botch an exit from Afghanistan? Yeah. Yes. Did we leave them? Oh, well, we left Americans stranded, but what did we leave behind? We, we equipped them. 
we equipped them with a whole lot of military equipment. So this has come up. There was a bombing today, um, and that's another one of the things that I wanted to share with you. They bombed a prison, which was actually holding um, immigrants. Over 100 are dead so far, and they're still searching. Um, and they have bombed mosques, and they have started bombing military bases, and ISIS is beginning to show its colors. It's just starting to um, become active again. Yeah. When we were in Afghanistan, the, we allowed the Taliban to come in and, and said, well, these are our friends. They're going to help us. And then as they came in, they went through the prisons and they released all of the ISIS prisoners. And that is what we left the people of Afghanistan to survive through. Yes. No, they're, they're a philosophy, they're a mindset. They're what in our United States would be called an extremist group, kind of like parents at school board meetings. <laughs> parents at school board meetings. You, you have to have watched the news to understand that, I'm sorry. They are declaring that parents who go and fight with school boards to protect their children are called domestic terrorists. And the FBI is now searching them. Yes. So anyway, that's not what I wanted to bring. So I wanted you to see this. <laughs> the formation of the United Nations happened in 1945. Uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt met with the Soviet premier, Joseph Stalin, and, uh, and they met in Iran, of all places, um, in 1943. They set up a 10-member executive committee, but the interesting thing is the United States, excuse me, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and China would enforce peace as the four policemen. And, and we're going to see how this starts to play out. All right. So history tells us, spirit of prophecy tells us, history would be repeated. So now we're going to back up just a little bit to Daniel chapter 7. Um, and we're going to take a look at verse 12 and 17. So Jan Daniel chapter 7 verse 12 reads, As concerning the rest of the beasts, so God had just shown them the destruction of that fourth beast. And then it says concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So while history had played its part out, they would have a modern day counterpart that involve the conglomerate beast, I call it, at the end of time. And we're going to see how this begins to take place. And if you go down to verse 17, it says, these great beasts, which are how many? Four. Are four kings which shall arise. Daniel is standing in the third year of Belshazzar, and, and the head of Babylon is about to be done away with to move on to the arms. So why would God say, that these are four kings that shall arise because it would be three by then, right. not four, if it was for their time. But then it ends with something even more curious. They would arise out of what? The earth, the earth. Where had the first four beasts come from? The sea. The sea. So this is where these are the same beasts, but they have a modern day time. They're an already established people that are going to arise again on the earth. That's where I, I want to bring, we had the lion that was made to stand up on the earth. These beasts are now going to come out of the earth, meaning they already have been established. They just have a future representation. 
Did any of those go away? No, we know from Daniel 2, every one of them is present when the feet are destroyed. All right. So let's take a look at Daniel 8. Some of these verses that are here are so significant when it's talking about this goat. Verse 12 is talking about the tall horn. It says, and it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. Who is a little horn that grows up to be great? It's the same horn over and over and over again. Who is it? It's Rome. Okay. Let's look at verse 17. At the time of the end shall be the vision. Let's look at verse 19. In the last end of the indignation. What happens if you get to the last end of something? Is it going to keep going? No. No. Has this story played out? Not completely, but did it play out in Daniel's day? Yes. Not completely. Right. That's, this is to tell us this is the end of the indignation, the last end. For at, here's that terminology again, the appointed time the end shall be. And then let's look at verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom. Who's there? Ah, so the four kingdoms in the first vision are one image, but they're separate kingdoms, right? Now they're going to combine to form one kingdom, their kingdom. Okay, verse 24 and 25 says, for a time of, for a time, evil will win. Are we seeing that happen right now? The scary part is we're going to really see that happen shortly. And we are going to need to hang on to Jesus for dear life to get through that. Verse 24 or 26 says, For it shall be for many days. It's in the future. So God is giving this to Daniel and he's telling him it's in the future. It's in the future. It's for the very end. It's, it's the end. It could be a lot, yes. If you look at it prophetically, that's true. Verse 27 says, but no one understood it. So if you read through this, Daniel sees this first, the beast coming up out of the sea, and he asks for somebody to explain it to him. And God sends the angel who explains it to him, and it and makes it very clear the angel's job was to make Daniel understand. If God gives an angel a job to make you understand, are you going to understand? Yes. Yes. But then in in chapter 7, the dream continues, or the the vision changes. He sees the beast destroyed. He sees, and then it says down here, um, he's grieved in his spirit, verse 15. In the midst of his body, in the visions of my head troubled me, and he came near to someone, and he said, explain this to me. And so they go on to explain it to him, but at the end it tells us, at the, at the end of Daniel 7, I'm sorry, verse 28, it says, Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my con- conjugations which troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. And then Um, If we go on to Daniel 8, he's had this vision of the goat and the ram. Look at verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision. And then what does it say? Okay. If I was to give you a vision of what's going to happen 3,000 years from now, People dressed different, they looked different, they transported different, everything was different. Even if I told you what was happening, would you necessarily understand? No. And so here Daniel's vision is being given, but he's like, wow, I I don't get it. (laughs) And and some people say part of what Daniel couldn't understand, what he couldn't wrap his mind around, is that the horn power would, would kill Christ, that Jesus would die. And, and I think that's a legitimate thing he was probably floored by as well, because he was given that information also. So I want to propose to you 
that the horn that's broken off, if it's the United States military, that actually ties in with one of Sister White's prophecies. The UN is growing great. What is the UN's agenda right now? They are looking for one world order. They are looking for a great reset. They are looking for a financial world currency. And they, they <laughs> want Obama to be United States representative. Yeah, they want a lot of lovely things that are quite terrifying. But yeah. if you look at any of the books that are being written by, um, oh dear, who's the German man? Soros, yes. Yeah. Soros is, is a part of this whole economy and he's a part of all the finances and he's tied in with the UN and he's oh, yeah. tied in with, and he's written books about how they think this is going to all play out. But anyway, um, the United Nations is growing and growing and growing in power and who is helping that grow in power? The papacy is completely behind the growth of the United Nations into power. Because it needs, does Rome have its own police force? No. It kind of does in the Jesuits. But not big enough to control the world. And if it can control the United Nations, it can control the whole world and that can function. What is the military portion of the United Nations called? It's called NATO. They're the guns behind the power there. But we're told in the spirit of prophecy that when the United States legislates Sunday as law to for worship in our country, that we will experience complete economic ruin. So for that horn to be broken off, that allows for so many things to happen. And here's another thing for you to think about. Brexit. Mm -hmm. Britain exited from the, the EU. That was prophetic. That has to happen because of the role they're going to play. And we're watching it happen even, even today. All right. So if we put the four beasts that were part of Daniel's vision earlier... Onto these four horns, we know Rome fits, right? Because if you look at the criteria, it's very clear. Um, now we just need to know who those other countries would be. Um, and I think we just talked about that. The one verse we didn't look at was verse 23 that talked about the whole earth worshiping. Um, and that hasn't happened yet, has it? Okay. Okay. And we talked about that. So we're going to move on. So I want to ask you why there are no depictions of Australia, Africa, Mexico, South America, or the islands of the sea being involved in the conglomerate beast that's formed in Revelation 13. They must not have anything to offer money-wise or power-wise. They don't fit with prophecy. It's the same image, remember? The same countries are present when those feet are destroyed. And so they have to come from the proper places. And so we can't just say, well, I like this country, so let's stick them in there. It doesn't work that way. All right. Damn. Revelation 17, 8 says, The beast thou sawest was not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go unto, into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wander, whose names were not written in the book of life, when they behold the beast that was, is not, and yet is. And who, what beast would that be? It's that fourth beast. Because it received the deadly wound, and for a time, did it stop being a religious power? Never. It stopped being a military power. It lost its right to control and to govern. That's when they locked the Pope up, and Napoleon and those involved in that process. Okay, so it looked like it wasn't, and yet we know that it is, because as soon as they locked the Pope up in that tower, what did Rome do? They created the Jesuits. 
and they used them to try to infiltrate every educational system, every church, every bank, every country. They put them in place to try and control um, and get that power brought back to the church. Have they been successful? <laughs> yes, they sure have. So if we take a look at this, this is just an overview to remind you. This ram is, the goat's going to come, destroy the ram, the goat will grow up great, the main horn will be broken off, four will come up out of it, which are going to make their kingdom, okay? So soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy, Daniel 11, will be repeated. Will be repeated. Scenes similar to those described in the words will take place. Had they already taken place? Yeah. Yes, but they would be repeated in modern time, in our time, at the end of time. She says, let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for now we are entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. And she quotes Daniel 12, 1 to 4. Um, Conrad Vine, who I have deep respect for as a godly man, recently did a study um, and it's on his website again I will email you this information if you want it this is a chart it's written so small I have to use a magnifying glass to read it even printed this is I don't know how many pages it shows you Daniel 11 broken down verse by verse, and it shows all the Adventist different philosophies of the interpretation and understanding of Daniel 11. Do they all agree? No. There are three main philosophies, including Uriah Smith's that are here, and if you want that information, I am very happy to make sure that you have that information. There are other groups, Daniel 11 and 12. Daniel 11, all the different interpretations and prophecies. Do we know it all? We don't. We have to keep studying. We need to understand. Okay, who do you think might be the bear today? If you've listened to the news at all, everybody is saying, don't poke the bear. Stop poking the bear. We're poking the bear. <laughs> Leave the bear alone. Quit poking the bear. Russia is depicted everywhere as a bear, okay? Interestingly enough, Russia, the property that is there, um, was the beginning of Russia is territory that was taken over by the Medes and Persians when they took over the world power at that time. It is not a far stretch to make the bear Russia today. It's depicted even in political cartoons. Russia's the bear. Guess what the lion is? Great Britain. It's everywhere. Okay? It's everywhere. Here's the lion, Great Britain, taking over India and controlling um, many parts of India. Even Africa. Where did we get apartheid from? Who took over parts of Africa? Again, there's a war, they divide up the country, and whoever gets what they want, and that's how the map is played out. Don't poke the bear with the NATO umbrella. This, <laughs> this is relevant today. Russia has everything they've got lined up on the border of Ukraine, and now another country that's there, I can't even remember the name. We tried, NATO, through the UN is trying to make the Ukraine a NATO country, and Russia's saying, you can't do that, it belongs to us. Right. And literally, excuse the terminology, but all hell is breaking loose over there right now over this, this issue, okay? So when we lined, Russia lined up, then we started lining up, then the UN started lining up, and then China started lining up, 
and Iran and Iraq started lining up because China and Russia are friends with Iran and Iraq and okay so this is like some kid came along and just started whacking on the bees nest with a stick okay yeah. that's exactly yeah. what is happening right now around us so the U UN uses NATO NATO came in and they said well you know if you don't whatever we're gonna do this and Russia said if you touch Ukraine we're gonna blow up all of your military satellites that are around the world right now. There's 42 or three of them. We'll blow them all up at one time. So just to prove their point, Russia shot off a rocket and shot one of their own dead satellites and blew the packing out of it up in the atmosphere. The pieces threatened the International Space Station, so they had to draw everything in and hunker down because they weren't sure where the debris was gonna go. Then shortly after that, China set off a rocket into the outer environment, then launched something from it, and it went around the world, I don't know how many times, and then it politely landed off the United States' west coast in the Pacific Ocean. It was like a glider. They could control whatever it was, okay? So a week later, Russia said, well, this is fun, let's do that. So they shot off a rocket, and they launched something from their rocket and it went around the globe and around the globe and around the globe and it got five miles above the earth and they said let's let's tweak people's brains and it started to climb back up again oh, wow. and people went crazy <laughs> the internet was just exploding with with all of the stuff going on eventually it came down landed politely off the west coast of the United States in the Pacific Ocean. North Korea said, well, that looks like fun. They sent a rocket up, and everybody said, oh, it was a dud. It didn't land anywhere near our people. And other people are like, yeah, well, maybe that was intentionally. There's a lot going on, people, that, that impacts us. Okay, so take a look at this. China is the only country that has four heads. Okay, and we're going to take a look at this. But here, China has an airplane, a bomber, that's called the Flying Leopard. Their commando unit is called the Snow Leopards. And if you look, China has control of four island countries that surround them. North Korea is off of their border. They are not controlled by China but they have a very careful relationship. Yeah. North Korea doesn't trust them, and they don't trust North Korea. Um, they have an interesting relationship going on there, but what's even more interesting is that what's outside of North Korea is South Korea, and we will find that they have something called the Four Asian Tigers. You'll find it everywhere if you study it. There's South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Has China reclaimed Hong Kong? Yeah. Yes. Has China reclaimed Singapore? They're working on it. They haven't completely, but pretty much. And are they trying to reclaim Taiwan right now? Yeah. Okay. So in the initial, the leopard was one beast broke into four heads. Here at the end of time, I think we're seeing the four heads pull back into one beast, and you'll see why I believe that in a minute. Is Taiwan saying that they're threatened by China? Yes, every day. It's everywhere in the news. All right. Revelation is a sealed book, the prophecy says, but it is also an open book. It records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of Earth's history. The teachings of this book are definite they are not mystical and unintelligible it is the same line of prophecy that is taken up as in daniel repeat that line for me <clears throat> i'm choking <laughs> are they the same beasts yes the sun, she says some prophecies god has here's our word again repeated 
thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a tickle. All right, so we're going to go, and it's Revelation 13. I thought I fixed that. <coughs> I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Let's go to Revelation 13, not Revelation 16. We are nearing the end of the journey a little bit here. <coughs> you pray for me. That is exactly right. <clears throat> My eyes are watering and everything. Okay. In Revelation 13, we have a beast that is going to rise from where? Look at verse 1 out of the sea. What do the sea represent? Populations. All right. <clears throat> it's going to have ten crowns, a name of blasphemy on every head. It's going to look like a what? Shepherd. And a what? Eat bear. And it's going to have the mouth of a lion. lion. Who were those four countries listed <clears throat> that were the police force of the UN? Great Britain, Russia, Russia, and China. And then it talks about the United States, but we know from this vision that the United States becomes its own beast. Right. That horn is broken off. <clears throat> it doesn't list Rome on the list of the United Nations. Why? Not only that, but Rome is, is like the body of the ram. It's, it's the philosophy that everything is built on. <clears throat> we have the Paris Accord agree, Agreement happening. The UN is pushing everyone to follow that. And the foundation of the Paris Accord Agreement is Laudato Si. It's the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si, which we have talked about in our other presentations. Yes. So, here are the three beasts of Revelation 13. We have the dragon, we have the conglomerate beast, excuse me, and we have the false prophet. So we're going to take a look at the dragon. Why does the dragon have seven heads? There's actually a good reason. The first head is the first attempt to seize the daily from Christ, or the scepter of power, and it happened in the, the war in heaven. The second head is the second attempt that happened in the Garden of Eden. The third head is his attempt to seize the daily at the Tower of Babel, which is the plain on which the country of Babylon was built up. And he tried to swallow God's people in Babylon. But Daniel and his three faithful friends and others, there were um, Ezra, Nehemiah, there were other people involved in that process that were faithful, prevented that from happening. God won and his people went back to rebuild Jerusalem. The fourth head, the fourth attempt was when Jesus was on earth. He tried to kill him when he was two. We're told that literally all hell was against Christ when he was on this earth, even as a child. Every day, Satan gave him everything he had, and he was there in person. And then, of course, we know about the fast in the wilderness, the, the three temptations, and then the crucifixion of Christ. But he didn't win because Jesus was resurrected from the dead. The fifth attempt is the Dark Ages, when Satan, through Papal Rome, tried to completely destroy God's Sabbath and his people. The sixth attempt 
is what we are living in now. We have seen the deadly wound is healed. The Pope has come back to power. And this is the subject of Daniel 12 timelines, which are on this chart over here and is the next presentation that I have. Um, we know about what's coming. There is literal days of persecution coming in Daniel 12 that are mainly, very clearly laid out. We know that there's a timeline for that second papal reign that is about to happen. And we know that these are literal days and they are happening now. And um, I'll be happy to share that with you if you want to hear it. The dragon's seventh head will be his seventh attempt when the new Jerusalem comes down to the earth and he tries to rally everyone against God. Each kingdom is an attempt by Satan to have universal rule. He's trying to do it through kingdoms, but every kingdom has persecuted, starting with Cain and Abel. We know about the flood, the Tower of Babel, the image of Daniel too. Every kingdom involved, did Babylon persecute religious wise? Yes, because we have the story of the fiery furnace. Did Medo Persia persecute? <clears throat> Daniel in the lion's den is given to us in the scriptures. Don't hear anything about Greece. So I did some research. Oh, scariness. I want you to know. Greece was a very persecuting power. And even as in our times in the 1900s, they were doing Christian genocide. They were just slaughtering people in Greece who were Christians. So now we're going to look at the second beast. We looked at the dragon, excuse me, and now we're going to look at, at the second beast, which is the United States. So there's two horns, republicanism, no king, protestantism, no pope. People draw it like a lamb, but I did research, and nowhere does Ellen White describe it as a lamb, and neither does the Bible. It is described having lamb-like character traits, meaning it has the character traits. It's founded on the traits of God's kingdom, Jesus the Lamb. The Lord has done more for the United States than any other country upon which the sun shines. Here he provided an asylum for his people where they could worship him according to the dictates of their conscience. Here Christianity has processed in its purity, sorry, progressed in its purity, the life-giving doctrine of the one mediator should ever remain free for all people to worship him in accordance with the dictates of conscience. He designed that its civil institutions in their expansive productions should represent the freedom of gospel privileges. But the enemy of all righteousness has designed upon, designs upon God's purpose for this country. He will bring in enterprises that will lead men to forget that there is a God. Are we living in those times? <clears throat> Worldliness and covetousness, which is idolatry, will prevail through the working of the arch deceiver till the law of God in all its bearings shall be made void. When the Sunday law is instituted by legislation, we will know that it is the complete fulfillment of this situation. Where does the United States come from? <clears throat> we have always heard it taught that the United States was formed here because it was unpopulated. Is that true? Okay, sparsely populated. But was it sparsely populated? There are a lot of Native American peoples who were here. And was it founded as a new nation to begin with? No. no. It was Britain. Britain came over, that the persecuted people from Britain came over. We were under British rule, and we had to fight the American Revolution to create this United States of America as we know it today. So this is where I would like to say, I believe that that coming out of the earth may have another implication. Yes, it was much less populated than other parts, especially Europe. At that time in Europe, you, your son could never buy another piece of land. You were locked in whatever state of financial status you were in because there was nowhere to go. Um, however, I think there might be another meaning for that. 
the United States was actually formed out of a previously existing country, which was Britain. And then we fought for freedom to establish our country the way we wanted it to be. So we're told that this beast will speak like the dragon, and it will speak and cause those who would not worship the beast to be killed. killed. Who is going to push for the universal death decree? Our country is going to be the one that's going to push for the universal death decree. It is also going to make it so that people have to accept the mark. The mark is going to be you worship on Sunday or you can't what? Buy or sell. We're going to exercise all the power of the beast. So the United States will have just as much power as the beast so it doesn't have to be attached to the beast. It's going to have the same kind of power. But listen to what we as a nation of freedom are going to do. It says, this is the beast that will make or cause the earth, <clears throat> a Sunday for the earth, and them that shall dwell therein to worship, the universal Sunday law, the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Are we going to worship the conglomerate beast? No. No. All that beast is showing us is who the power players are at the end. All that the, uh, we're going to do is make people worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed, the very first one, which is Rome, right? And so that's the role that we are going to play. She says in the Great Controversy that the speaking of a nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. She talks about the fact that they're going to call down fire from heaven. If you read in the spirit of prophecy, that is talking about a false Holy Spirit, a false revival, and that they're going to perform all kinds of signs and wonders that if possible, even his very elect would be deceived by. If you've heard of the call and the send, um, we've talked about them before. These are huge movements in the evangelical churches that are bringing about modern, that are including modern spiritualism. Um, thousands of people are filling football stadiums. Um, check into it. It'll give you the nightmares. I will, <laughs> it, this beast will cause all to receive the mark of Sunday worship in their forehead, meaning they believe in it and they support it in their hand because they consent to it. Can we choose to do things we do not believe in to protect our families or feed our people? <clears throat> We've done it all throughout history. And if you won't do those two things, then they prefer you to die. I just threw this in so you could see political people are always drawing cartoons that show beasts and animals as nations. You can sit here and look at this and easily pick out what these nations are, either by the flag hat that they're wearing or, or what they are. So here we have a beast that's going to come out of the sea in Revelation 13, but in Revelation 17, 9 through 11, this same beast comes out of the bottomless pit. And it talks about the heads of the beast in Revelation 17. Okay, so there are five that are fallen, meaning they're no longer in power, okay? So five of those heads would be the three beasts that we know had their dominion taken away, but they're reserved for a time and a purpose later. We know that Rome was political. That's number five on the beast there. Did it lose its power? Politically, yes, it gave it to the papacy. Number two head, we can see, is Rome with the deadly wound, okay? Yeah. And then number one is the deadly wound healed. And this is the active head that is controlling this beast, these powers. You have to remember this is representing military might, political power. Was Rome given back its political power? Yes. yes. 
Stalin gave him back his country, Rome, as a political country. All right. <clears throat> Revelation 17, 12, and 13 talks about the ten horns. We know that these are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, um, but they get to have one hour with the beast, which we know is the sixth plague. It's the Battle of Armageddon. They're going to give all their power to this they beast. These have one mind, and they shall give their power and strength to the beast. So the horns are going to be ten kingdoms. The heads are kingdoms. We know that this is going to become a one world. So are we going to have a one world order? Absolutely. We have to. We have to because it's prophetic. Are we still going to have our own country? Yes. But is it going to have the power it used to have? No. No. It's going to give its power to the beast. And so this talks about the head that was wounded to death. This talks about the, the wound that was healed. And it talks about its, its power and its seat and its authority. Okay, so we're also told, and I'm going to have to turn around because that's too far away for me to see. So this dragon, we are told, is going to give its power to the beast, okay? And it is going to be this process that is going to fill this beast until it becomes a scarlet beast. It means that that beast will be fully possessed by Satan, and it's going to do his bidding, okay? And that's what it means to come out of the bottomless pit, and we're going to take a look at that in a minute. It's going to have a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and it's going to continue 40 in two months. That's the Daniel 12 presentation that we have next. This beast is going to perform miracles in the sight of this beast, and this beast is going to speak like Satan himself. That's our country that we're going to see this happening. Ezekiel 38 covers the Battle of Armageddon. It covers all of these same things. It's amazing to me how many of the prophets in the Old Testament present this information. Oh, dear. Oh, it came back. Praise God. Okay. So it goes on in Revelation 17 and 18, and it talks about the beast coming from the bottomless pit. Spirit of Prophecy tells us it's the philosophies of the French Revolution. We'll look at those in a minute. Why did I draw the beast this or the woman this way? <laughs> the whore that is described there, we'll talk about that in a minute. We know that she rides a scarlet beast. We know that probation is going to be fully closed, 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 and that Satan is going to fully control the populations of the earth, uh, except for those whose name is written in the book of life. All right. The mindset of the French Revolution was mob mentality, atheism, no God, worshiping the goddess of reason. Are we seeing this happen right now all around us? Worship science, so-called. Um, if you understand anything about the French Revolution, the third one up here, they literally took a prostitute, stuck her up on a horse, tore her blouse open, and gave her a scepter and paraded her through the streets and, and said, worship the goddess of reason. Are we in a time of sexual impurity in the world like we have never seen it before? We are seeing all of these things happen. So why is she drawn this way? The colors of the great whore are scarlet and purple. The colors of the sanctuary are scarlet and purple and blue. Blue stands for the law, and it stands for truth, and it stands for purity. Um, there's no blue in any of the descriptions of the harlot. Revelation 17, 1 to 6, gives description of the harlot. She went into the wilderness. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Clothed in linen, purple, scarlet. All of the elements involved in the sanctuary are represented in the harlot, other than blue, which stands for the law. 
The golden cup of her hand is full of the abominations of her philosophies, filthiness of her fornication. Her forehead reads mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of all harlots. Rome has no, no sisters, only daughters. And we'll look at that in a minute. The woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. And if you look at that last line, the woman which thou sawest is that great city who reigns over the kings of the earth. I wanted it very clearly understood who the woman is. If you've ever seen the Vatican, that's what you're looking at here. And you're looking at the Pope's crown. There, and this is an article that was just recently, in the last few years, put out by the Vatican, stating that they have no sisters. They only have daughters. They're doing their best to make sure they comply with this, let me tell you. <laughs> Revelation 17, 3, 6, and 7. This is interesting. The angel comes and offers to show John the judgment of the great whore. And the angel takes John into the wilderness. Why does he take John into the wilderness? In Revelation 12, the pure woman is given the two wings of an eagle, which represents the United States, and she flies into the wilderness. And John marvels and wonders with great admiration, and the angel asks him why. It's because the pure woman of Protestantism that is driven into the wilderness has become the whore of apostate Protestantism that has returned to Rome and the woman who went into the wilderness to hide and be protected from persecution will become the greatest of persecutors. Wow. And John cannot understand how the woman will persecute her, her offspring, her remnant. Remember, Jesus has won, and he is coming back for his people. But we've got to hang on to him tightly so that we can be under his wings to survive what lays ahead. Yes. The other thing is when Jesus comes, we're going to have hail balls that are about 135 pounds hitting the ground. We're going to have the islands disappearing into the ocean and the mountains are going to be torn from their roots. Um, the earth is going to be heaving and reeling. Um, yeah, Satan's going to do a lot of destruction, but he can't replicate that part either. I don't know, but he does. <laughs> I, just, I just know who's in charge, and I can rest in that. <laughs> if I try to figure it out, it's not working out very well. <laughs> All right, we're going to close with prayer, and then you can stop the video. And if, if you have any questions, I'll stay for those who have questions. Father in heaven, there's a lot here to swallow in one meeting, but in order to understand the thread and consistency, it's necessary. It really is a simple process. It's not all complicated and chopped up in pieces. We thank you that you are a God of order, that you are a God who wants us to understand. You wouldn't tell us to study if it was impossible for us to understand. We thank you. We ask you to be with us and protect us as we travel home. The roads are kind of special. And we thank you for your answers to our prayers. Save our souls. And help us to be ready for your coming and to help everyone around us that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Are any of you have any questions? I'm happy to answer if you do. Yes. Um, when you ask me to, I 